Let me begin with a broad rule of thumb that our scholars pretty much all agree on. It is considered for you to be wasting money when you spend money in something that has no worldly utility or religious utility. Once again, has no tangible worldly benefit or hereafter religious benefit, now we have a problem. So imagine someone buys a gold-plated iPhone. Now that's not even a good investment and it depreciates over a period of time. There's not much worldly utility there. That SubhanAllah in the early generations, when the hadith of the Prophet was mentioned, they had such an overwhelming feel. They would experience this sense of gravity that you and I don't necessarily experience today. So one of the great companions of the Prophet وسلم, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Like this person knew the Prophet for like 20 plus years. And when you know someone for this long, your dynamic becomes a little chill. You know, things are not as stiff. And here you have Abdullah ibn Mas'ud who knew the Prophet for 20 years. Yet one of his students says, اِخْتَرَفْتُ إِلَىٰ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ ibn مَسْعُودٍ سَنَةً فَمَا سَمِعْتُهُ يَقُولُ قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ He's like, I accompanied Abdullah ibn Mas'ud for a year and I never heard him quote the Prophet directly. Until one day. يَوْمًا سَمِعْتُهُ يَقُولُ قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ سَوَسْمَا فَعَلَاهُ كَرْبٌ He said, the Prophet وسلم, said once in one year, and when he quoted the Prophet وسلم, I saw Abdullah ibn Mas'ud shaking. I heard distress on his face. I heard him overcome with this sense of worry because now he's attributing something directly to the Prophet وسلم, and he better be right. This was a level of seriousness the early generations had. But Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib was lying down because wa huwa marid, because he was sick. And a man just barged in. He's like, Ya Sa'id, ya, ya. you know, he's like, Ya Shaykh, uh, hadithni an nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell me something from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I need, a, I have a question on a hadith. Um, the, their narration goes on to say that Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib struggled to sit down properly and then he started narrating the hadith. So the person got, kind of got a little embarrassed, low-key. He's like, you know, I don't want to bother you. You know, I don't want to inconvenience you. Sa'id ibn Musayyib says, Inni akrahu an uhaditha haditha Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ana It's like, I would hate that I narrate a hadith of the Prophet and I'm lying down. That's not going to fly. And this is the level of respect people had and that's what I'm hoping for, inshallah. If, if we can capture just 10% of that, I think we're good, inshallah. So, Hadith that you and I have been studying is a hadith of al mughira ibn Shu'bah, hadith 298 from Al-Adab al-Mufrad of Imam Bukhari, where al mughira ibn Shu'bah, he received a letter from the Khalifa of the time, Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiyallahu anh, another great companion. Mu'awiyah radiyallahu anh writes to him, Uktub ilayya, write to me something, he's requesting from al mughira radiyallahu anh, write to me something you heard directly from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he wrote him back a letter in which he said that the Prophet ﷺ would ask us to stay away from the following things. And he lists six things and I'll kind of read them off for you. Number one, pointless conversations. Number two, wasting money. Number three, unnecessary asking. Number four, depriving others of their rights. Number five, disobedience of mothers. Ah. And number six, abortion of their daughters where they would bury their daughters alive. Now in the previous sections or in the previous sessions that we have conducted for Sunnah Fix, we have talked about pointless conversations and unnecessary asking. Today I want to talk about wasting money. That's going to be the topic today folks. Because of course you and I are living in times where mashallah there's an abundance of wealth especially in America. I read a statistic that if you make about $90,000 you're in the top 1% of the world. Because majority of the world makes about $3,000 worth of income. And if you're making 90, you're already in the top 1%. Now obviously, in America, across the world, we all know the rich get richer. But even a middle class person in America is on the top of the pyramid, globally speaking. Now, we got money to throw around. We got cash to burn, folks. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the adab of money. And at what point are you considered someone who's wasting money? At what point are you considered someone who's being excessive? So, allow me to begin by telling you the attitude of Quran and Sunnah when it comes to spending money excessively. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, khudhu zeenatakum inda kulli masjid. That, oh you who believe, like embrace beauty anytime you're in the vicinity of a masjid or prayer scene. 
And then, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا Go ahead and drink and eat and consume, but do not be musrif. What's a musrif? Musrif is someone who pushes and crosses boundaries. They like to push the boundaries, they like to cross the boundaries. They're, they're what we call in English transgressors, trespassers. Don't be someone who's a musrif, Allah says. Don't cross red lines. And then another place in the Quran, Allah says, وَلَا تُبَذِّرْ تَبْذِيرًا When it comes to your wealth. What is badr in Arabic? Arabs back in the days, when they would throw seeds onto the field, they were like throwing seeds around just so cultivation can occur. They would say, بَذْرُ الْحَبْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَيْ فَرَّقْتَهُ فِيهَا Throwing around seeds so that they can eventually grow, that throwing around and splashing around, that was called badr. So imagine, the, hopefully you can picture it now. This is someone who's like literally thrown around cash, like chips on a poker table. You don't want to do that. And that's what happens actually in casinos. People just throw around money because they got so much of it. And then in another place in the Quran where Allah is describing Ibadul Rahman, the dedicated servants of the most merciful. Like these are elite servants of Allah. How does he describe them? When it comes to spending money, Lam Yusrifu, they're not extravagant. Walam Yaqturu. And they're not people who are like stingy and tight fisted. Here's something beautiful in Arabic. Notice the ayah begins with plural. Those servants of Ar-Rahman, when it comes to spending, they're not tight-fisted, but they're not extravagant either. And then all of a sudden it becomes singular. Suggesting that every person, Allah says, has their own median line, moderate line. And they have their own median standard. Servants of Ar-Rahman are right in the middle. They're moderate. And how do you determine what's moderate for you? It depends on your standard of living, the money that you make, your income bracket. So it's really beautiful in the Quran. There's no one standard for everyone in terms of what's extravagant for someone who makes 250K a year. Someone is making million dollars a year versus someone working on minimum wage. Standard of what's medium for them differs. That's why Allah shifts it to the singular, meaning it's a subjective thing, person by person. And my dear brothers and sisters, our Prophet ﷺ told us that your feet on the Day of Judgment will not move until Allah will ask you five questions. The first question Allah will ask you is, what did you do with the years of your lives? How did you let them elapse? What did you put them in? And then, specifically when it comes to the days of your lives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will zoom down and say, what about your youth? I gave you youth. You were supposed to be able to do certain things in your youth. You will not be able to do in an older age. What did you do with your youth? Where did that expire? Because as a young person, you can wake up for Fajr, survive on a few hours of sleep, you can walk to the masjid, you can fast. But you're not able to do all those things in old age. Allah will say, I gave you the vigor of youth. Where did that go? And then, next two questions, Allah will ask you, where did you earn your wealth? And where did you spend it? That's question three and four. And finally, what did you, with the, what did you do with the knowledge how did you act upon the ilm that you had? My dear brothers and sisters, as if this hadith is telling us on the Day of Judgment, if someone is, someone is just flushing down their money, throwing their money down the sink as they say, Allah will be their auditor on the Day of Judgment. And Aisha radiallahu anha tells us from, in a hadith from the Prophet if Allah audits you, you're in trouble. You know, I used to work in the corporate world, so if the corporation or we heard that an audit is coming, there was a sense of dread that would take over. Man, the auditors are coming. They're gonna dig up some dirt. They're gonna go through all our accounts. They're gonna go through our bank statements. No one likes auditors because of the things that come up. This is the case with human beings. Yet, we don't shiver at the idea that Allah will open up your accounts on the Day of Judgment and He'll ask you, you spend 5K on custom rims? Prada glasses, $700? Like, like do, do you and I have a response for this? Now, of course, the sentiment of our Desi brothers and sisters is that, you know, when they hear about the five questions on the Day of Judgment, they're like, you know, brother, Alhamdulillah, two questions are at least easy. Where did you make your money from? Most of us are in IT, Alhamdulillah, pretty much halal, and we don't really like spending money, so that's going to be an easy topic. But as for the rest of us, who are a little bit more uh, forthcoming with our spending, just be careful that it may come up on the Day of Judgment, an audit may take place. And that's why in the early generations, there was a sense of caution about reckless spending of money. Where Imam Ahmad narrates to us in his book, At-Kitab al-Zuhd, that once Jabir ibn Abdullah, man, you gotta appreciate this story. 
Jabir once passes by Umar bin Khattab on the road, and Jabir is carrying fresh meat, probably like a juicy cut of meat he had just bought from the marketplace, and now he's like headed home, he's like, I can't wait to like roast this thing or whatever. Who does he pass by? Umar ibn Khattab. So Umar ibn Khattab asked him, Mahada. He says, Hada lahmun ishtaraytuhu ishtahaytuhu. It's like, I was craving meat and I just went ahead and bought it. Umar ibn Khattab, a little bit of a buzzkill here. Umar ibn Khattab says, Aba kulla mashtahaytuhu ishtarayta. Everything that you, every time your nafs desires something, you go ahead and fulfill it. Every time your nafs craves something, and you, you beeline to the store and take care of it. He's like, أَمَا تَخْشَىٰ أَن تَكُونَ مِنْ أَهْلِ هَذِهِ الْآيَةَ أَذْهَبْتُمْ طَيِّبَاتِكُمْ فِي حَيَاتِكُمْ He said, are you not afraid that you fall under the ayah where Allah will say to certain people on the Day of Judgment, you had your fun in this world. You lived it up. You partied it out. You got all the wholesome stuff. What do you want now on the Day of Judgment? Are you not afraid that you might fall under this ayah? That if you are rushing to satisfy every craving and desire, that's why our scholars would say to keep your nafs and desires in check, time to time, fast from meat for a whole week. Sleep on the ground for a few days. You want to go to a trip? Delay. Because you want to, your nafs is like a spoiled child. If you keep giving in it's, to its demands, it just gets more and more annoying and demanding and pushy. So our scholars would say that sometimes what you want is what you want to delay. And this way, you're in charge of your nafs as opposed to your nafs being in charge of you. So my dear brothers and sisters, having understood the attitude of Quran and Sunnah, I want to pose a very important question. What is considered wasting money in Islam? That's a very important question every single one of us needs to ask. For instance, let me throw this question at you. You got an iPhone 14, and now iPhone 16 came out. You want to upgrade, 50 bucks a month. Is that extravagant? Am I being excessive? How do we really know? You see a shirt from Patagonia, $100, Lululemon, 130 Is that excessive? How do we figure it out? It's a little subjective, isn't it? So allow me to begin by giving you a broad definition of what is considered wasteful, إِضَاعَةُ mal in Islam. And then, inshallah, we're going to get into some specific definitions. Let me begin with a broad rule of thumb that our scholars pretty much all agree on. They say being wasteful is it is considered for you to be wasting money when you spend money in something that has no worldly utility or religious utility. That's considered to be like literally throwing away money, like flushing it down the drain. So if you're spending money on something that once again has no tangible worldly benefit, or hereafter, religious benefit, now we have a problem. So imagine someone buys a gold-plated iPhone. Now that's not even a good investment. And it depreciates over a period of time. So there's not much worldly utility there. Or someone buys, I don't know, buys an eagle or custom-made sneakers or whatever. It's just frivolous spending on depreciating assets. It's sheer stupidity. But the issue with this definition that I just gave you is that it's a little vague and um, it can, it can become a little subjective. It has a few loopholes in there. So imagine someone buys, I don't know, like a Louis Vuitton bag, and they're like, brother, this is not wasteful, because according to your definition, wasteful is something that has no worldly utility or religious utility. But when I buy a Louis Vuitton bag, guess what? It gives me status appeal. It gets me access to certain gatherings. So I got worldly benefit from it. And you can spin that argument with everything, right? You got a, mashallah, luxury watch collection. You're like, yeah, brother, but see, it helps me get into the cigar club or whatever. You know, it's like people can come up with all sorts of excuses. So we got to tighten this definition up a little bit. So allow me to give you two specific definitions that I really want you to remember. These are the two classical opinions on when is it considered that you are being way too extreme with spending money. Definition number one is a bit liberal, so I'll start with that. It's easier to swallow in stomach. Saeed ibn Jubair, the great student of Ibn Abbas, he was asked, عَنْ إِضَاعَةِ الْمَالِ Can you tell us what wasting money is? He says, أَنْ يَرْزُقَقَ اللَّهُ رِزْقًا فَتُنْفِقَهُ فِي مَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكَ He says, wasting money is when Allah gives you risk and you put that risk in haram. Therefore, according to this definition, the only thing that's considered wasteful spending is when you are spending money in, in haram. And by the way, this opinion is also attributed to Imam Malik. And now, according to this definition, a lot of things become permissible. So if you're buying designer clothes, 
I don't know, even for your pets, and you got this insane watch collection or sneaker collection, technically none of that is haram. So on this definition, technically it's all okay. I don't know about you, but spiritually it doesn't, doesn't sit very well with me. Here now the second definition comes, which once, once again, I incline to a little bit more, and I think it's a more of a practical definition. The second group of scholars, they say actually, what is considered wasting money is when someone either spends in haram or they're spending in halal way beyond their means. So back to the ayah of the Quran where Allah says, وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَٰلِكَ قَوَامًا Each person has their own standard or what is considered median, an average for them. Servant of Rahman, servants of Ar-Rahman, they're right in the middle. Now, spending in halal is permissible so long as you're spending in a way that's considered moderate for you. But if you're spending well beyond your means, where your income bracket cannot afford, now you're considered someone who's mudi'ul mad. You're considered someone who is extreme in spending money. So imagine someone throwing a big fat wedding, all right? They're barely making six figures and they're maxing out their credit cards because you know, you gotta impress the uncle. You know, you gotta show your face in the community. You gotta keep up with the Joneses. So this person is like taking out a loan just to throw a fancy wedding. That's considered someone who's wasting money. Or imagine someone whose dad is making minimum wage or his dad is driving Uber and he's like, Dad, I need Air Jordan 1s. Like, dude, poor guy is shopping at Goodwill and you wanna buy Air Jordan 1s. That's considered wasteful. Sure, now, if you make 250K a year or more and you're looking into a Benz or a Beamer, an Audi or a little higher, Okay, that's understandable because someone in your income class, probably that's the kind of whip they got, right? That's the kind of car they drive. So that's understandable. But even if you are someone who can afford luxurious things and is considered to be somewhat moderate for someone in your income bracket, our scholars here, they say that a believer is still conscious of the fact that when you are spending money, even if it's halal, even if it's considered moderate for you, a believer is always aware of the opportunity cost. Because let's say you make like a million dollars a year and having two, three cars, luxurious ones, not a big deal for you. But do realize that money that you're spending, that money could have been spent in charity, could have been spent in creating ongoing, continuous sadaqah jariya for you. That opportunity cost you have to live with. Because that money you spend after a yacht or whatever, Ritz Carlton, that money will amount to nothing on the Day of Judgment. And you'll show up on the Day of Judgment and sure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may not hold you to task for wasting money because, well, you had so much of it, it was considered moderate for you. But you will regret on the Day of Judgment the fact that I could have had so much, so many good deeds built up right now. I could have a mountain of good deeds I could have been looking at. It's instead, I spent a mountain, a stash of wealth on just like empty luxuries of this world. So this is something that you and I have to keep an eye out for. That even though you could afford it, even though it might be okay for you because mashallah you are someone who is in the upper class, understand the opportunity cost. And also one more thing folks, as a believer, we're always mindful of the fact that giving into your luxuries is kind of addictive. Your desires are addictive. You know, something weird about happiness is that a lot of people think that you know when I get that car or that beachfront property, I'll be happy. But here's the weird thing, the moment they get it, as if happiness shifts into something else. <laughs> it's like the milestone just moved away. And then you're aspiring for that. The moment you get it, happiness transfers into another object. That's how happiness works. And that's why it's like chasing a mirage. So a believer understands that constantly giving into luxuries means that your greed may be escalating and lack of contentment may be building up and therefore it pays to be conservative on this front. And you guys, the advice I gave you so far from a religious perspective, guess what? Secular financial gurus have something similar to say. You guys have heard of Warren Buffett? You know what he has to say on this? He's like, avoid lifestyle inflation. He says, don't spend more just because you earn more. Don't aspire to just make a living and spend aspire to make a difference. Mark Cuban, if he's someone who advised college students, he's like, you wanna be rich and financially independent one day, you need to have six months worth of income saved up. And you need to live like a college student even after you're done graduating from college because that's the amount of financial safety net that you have to build. Robert Ki uh, Kiyosaki, the author of Rich Dad and Poor Dad, he says, very beautiful advice for high schoolers and beyond, invest in assets, not liabilities. 
He says, use money to buy assets that generate income rather than stuff that, that drains resources and loses value over time. In fact, he says, if you're taking debt on anything, anything that doesn't appreciate over time, and you're taking a debt out and paying an interest, and that's whatever you have bought loses value with time. He's like, that's sheer lunacy. Why would you do that? On one hand, you're paying interest. On another hand, the asset that you bought is declining in value. And you guys, people who are in venture capitalism, which is basically, it's known as VC. I don't know if you guys know this. VCs, venture capitalists, have a 10% success rate. So what VCs do is that they invest in startup companies and they are, it's like high risk, high reward. So one out of 10 is successful. Now, these venture capitalists have a lot of cash they're sitting on and they're just throwing it away. You know why? Because money loses value over time. So imagine money is losing value over time because of inflation. On top of that, you're buying something like a car, which is a depreciating asset. So one of the financial gurus, he said, instead of giving your kid some video game that over a period of time will worth nothing in about five years, give your kid a stock that may increase in value with time. And that's smart thinking, y'all. Finally, I'll end on this. Dave Ramsey, he's a big name in entrepreneurship and beyond. He says, only take on debt for essentials. For you to pay interest on non-essentials debt, you're out of your mind. So with this, folks, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people who are cognizant of the wealth and the gift that it is. Allah calls wealth in the Quran khair. وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٌ إِن تَرَكَ خَيْرًا الْوَصِيَّةُ لِلْوَالِدِينَ Allah calls it khair because it leads to khair. It can lead to khair. Don't put it in shar. Be careful. Be conservative on this front. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be people who are financially smart and we are financially responsible and that we are not the ones on the sh showing up on the Day of Judgment having to worry about an audit. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.